Good morning, Jesus Image Church. Welcome online viewers. I woke up with such gratitude in my heart for Jesus today. Who here is thankful for the Lord? I am so thankful for Jesus. I want to read Psalm 95 to you. Let's posture our hearts in worship as we say this together. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We welcome you here. I thank you, Father, that it is your idea that we would meet and worship you. And you meet us here every time. You are faithful. We give you praise and we say, have your way today in us, Jesus. Come and move and be with your people. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Nothing can or ever will come between the love we share. We set our eyes upon the beauty of your face, oh Lord. Cause Father, your glory hurts in your name is one. Forever it is you 
all of the glory for you are the only one who is worthy you are holy Jesus and what an honor it is to even be invited into your presence Jesus so we thank you for your presence we thank you for being here Jesus Jesus, just tell him you love him. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Can we just lift up a shout of praise to the Lord? Just give it up for our amazing worship team. <laughs> All right, you guys can be seated. We get to stay in this place of worship and continue to give to the Lord. I'm going to read from Genesis 18, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. 
So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. And how often when we see the Lord coming and we're sitting in the heat of the day, do we just wait for him to come to us? But Abraham got up and he ran to him. He didn't wait for the Lord to come to him. He wasn't asking the Lord, what can you give me today? But he said, let me bring you water. Let me bring you food. Because he knew that he had the ability to move his heart and to refresh his heart. And so let us be like Abraham, that we would lift our eyes, that we would look and we would behold Jesus as he is coming and we would run to him. Not because of what he can give us, but because what we can give him because he is worthy and because he is good. That through worship, that in our time and everything that we do throughout our days, that we would live lives of worship, that we would sacrifice unto him because he is worthy of it. So Jesus, we lift our eyes and we look and we behold you today. Lord, and we say, do not pass us by. That if we have found favor in your sight, that you would not pass us by. Lord, but that we would run to you today and we would give you what you are worthy of. And you are worthy of all that we have, Jesus. And would our offering today refresh your heart to be a pleasing aroma unto you, Jesus. Bless the tithe and bless the offering, Jesus. We love you, Lord, in your precious name, amen. So we have a few ways to give. You guys can text give to the number on the screen. And then for those of you watching online, there is a number on your screen as well. And if you guys need an envelope, raise your hand and an usher will get you one. Um, you guys can rush the buckets and we will be back shortly.
I'm going to have Dion come up here for a moment. Give it up for Dion. <laughs> He's going to jump down. Will you jump down for us when you're done like you did that one time? Awesome. Uh, Dion's going to share, you know, he leads our outreach teams, and we have been going out with uh, church members, with some of our students, and God has been really blessing the outreach team. So they went out yesterday, yep. rain and all, right? And so Dion's going to share what the Lord did. Yeah, um, we want to, as a church, we want to bless our community. We want to give back to the community. We want to have um, outreach where we can go and preach the gospel and tell people about Jesus. So once a month, we've been going to Sanford uh, for, for a while now doing a food drive. And so yesterday, we had a food drive in Sanford uh, at Harvest Time International. And we were able to give away about 210 boxes of food, uh, which is a lot of food, um, to the community. <laughs> And we just saw um, the Lord work in a mighty way. Several people got saved. We preached the gospel. And every box of food that we gave away um, had a printed copy of the gospel. And then we preached the gospel uh, in person to as many people as we could. And many people got saved. And um, we actually have a neighborhood that's close by there. And so we'll, we'll give the food out at the food drive uh, on the property, but we'll also send a, sh a small team into a, a neighborhood, a community that the same neighborhood every time and just continuously because we want to make a presence in the neighborhood. And they're now becoming familiar with us and they're saying, oh, you're here again and stuff like that. So it's such a blessing uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to give back to the community. Amen. Thank you. We do that every month, correct, Dion? And if you guys want to get involved and do that as a church family, do you guys have the app? Who has not downloaded our app yet for the church? Michael. Okay. Don't pay attention to that. Um, well, download the app. It will give you all the things that are coming up. There it is. Part of it's missing, but just pretend that phone is a little bit to the side. Uh, but you can scan that with the QR code, and that will keep you up to date with everything that's going on. It has our worship on there as well. And if you want to come to the next outreach, and again, we're going to do these monthly, and God is really opening doors for us to serve people in different ways. I mean, we've been to prisons before. We want to just keep doing this. This is what Christians do, right? We, we share Jesus. We show Jesus. So if you want to be a part of that, you can find out any information on the website or on the app. Couple quick announcements. VBS is right around the corner, so we can put the information for that up. VBS, as I've said before, these children workers are just, be yes, Marina, yes. Um, they really shine Jesus. They know the one that they are teaching your children about. And um, last year, kids were encountering the Lord. It's going to be an amazing time. It is two weeks this year. So if you want to come be a part of VBS, well, if you want your kids to come be a part of VBS, um, just sign up there. You can go to JesusImageChurch.tv or text VBS to 321-320-80. 40. Um, also exciting news. This is not confirmed yet, but we are finalizing all the details this week. Youth camp. We're going to do our very first youth camp. 
This just excites me so much. I went to youth camp every year as a kid, and this is not going to be your traditional youth camp. Yes, there will be games and fun, but we are believing that the Holy Spirit will fall on our youth and touch them to go out and proclaim Jesus to the world. So if your kids are hungry and burning for Jesus, or if you want them to encounter Jesus, we want to invite you to this again. All the details will be finalized this week. So we will let you know more details, but these are the dates. Put them on hold, August 1 through 4th. It's going to be at Warren Wills Camp. That's about an hour and a half, not too far from here. If you're traveling and you don't live in Orlando, this is very close to Orlando Airport, not too far. We would love to invite your kids to come be a part of youth camp. So there's that. Amen. Last thing, another exciting announcement. We will be at OCC for the whole month of Sunday, for Sunday night. Thank you, Lord. That's exciting. This is uh, an answer to prayer, as you know. Well, Sunday night for the whole month of June. People know what month it is, right? They don't? For the month of June, we will be at the old former OCC That's where Michael got saved. That's the church that uh, I grew up in. That was my dad's church that he built. We're going to be there all of June. We are looking into doing a long-term lease, so there's more info to come with that. But we will be there the whole month of June. How many of you come the last few weeks? That's at, at, I'm going to, I can't. I call it OCC because I called it that my whole life. Um, God has been moving in a powerful way. (laughs) The air is charged. I don't know how else to say it. So get there. It's phenomenal what the Holy Spirit is doing. I pray that we go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper every single week. So just want to let you know that we will be there for the month of June for Sunday night. We will still be here at Lake Brantley for Sunday morning. Okay, now I'm going to welcome my husband, Michael. Good morning. Can we just stand and pray? Come on, just lift your hands, close your eyes. Lord, we love you and we worship you this morning. Just just fix all your attention on Jesus. We love you and we give you all of our attention. And now we look to you, precious Lord, to move, to flow to just blow through this room, Holy Spirit. You are the wind of heaven. And that's what Jesus calls you, the wind. So we just pray that you would have your way as we yield and surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift one more, one more. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Amen. 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 You can be seated. It's Pentecost Sunday. Aren't you glad you live in Pentecost? I'm going to teach this morning on the Holy Spirit. Uh, But before I do... um, I really hate announcements, but they're important when you're, some are important, some are not. (laughs) But uh, we're family and uh, it's important we move together. Uh, As you know, we are having our first pastor's conference September 22nd and 23rd. So if you are in the ministry and you want to come, there it is. I love that, uh, whatever you call that, that design there. I think it's so telling. And that's what we need again in America, right? Church is charged and filled with the presence of God. So if you're hungry, if you want to know how to build, how to watch the Lord build his own house in his own presence and see revival and move the Holy Spirit come to your church, we want to invite you. If you're watching from around the world, these are the dates. We would love for you to fly in. And uh, Carla, she went somewhere. (laughs) Her purse is there. Registration link is live, I imagine, right? Is that true, David? Okay. Also, House of Bethany, how many of you appreciate our worship community. Are you guys grateful for them? 
It is, um, our worship community is getting better and better and growing and growing and growing. And in 2017, uh, Lou Engel released a prophetic word over us. The greatest musicians and vocalists in the world would come and descend on our city and that they would learn to minister to Jesus. And uh, even prior to that, I've always dreamt of having a company of people who were well-trained in how to minister to the Lord, absolutely, but also becoming more and more excellent at their gift and their craft. And I'm so thankful for uh, our leaders. Uh, Alicia and Amy have been doing an amazing job in uh, just helping this thing go. But this is very vital to the overall calling on our house and over our city. Bethany was dear to the Lord, Jesus, and that's why we named it Bethany, because that was the place where lavish, unapologetic worship was poured out upon Jesus. And it became the place where Jesus loved to spend his time. You know, Jesus is the king of Jerusalem. How many of you know that? He's the king of Jerusalem. You can put that graphic back up just for a moment. He's the king of Jerusalem. He'll return to Jerusalem. But Bethany was special to him when he walked the earth. Jesus could not rest and recline where he healed the sick and there in Jerusalem where he taught and where he preached. Jerusalem became a place of great power. So did Galilee and other parts of the Holy Land. But Bethany was special because Bethany became the place of love. And what we want to do is make space, what we have been doing. I think we had 100 full-time House of Bethany students last year. That's amazing for our first year. And in that space, they're learning how to play their instruments, how to improve vocally, music theory, uh, spoke, what, what's that? Songwriting, spoken word. This year we're adding media. How many of you are thankful for our media team and what they give to the world? It's incredible. I think we have the best media team on planet Earth. Yohan and his team are the best. I just think they are. And I'm, I am biased, unapologetically biased, but I still think that. And we want to teach people how to do the same and give that away. But ultimately, it's unto Jesus. To have a 24 7 presence, you need 24 7 worship. It doesn't have to be a, a hop model, but the point is. Let me say it another way. That, that was an incorrect statement. For consistent presence, you need consistent worship and adoration. And that's what this is. This is what that makes space for. A company of hungry people who want to pour their fragrance upon the Lord so that that fragrance fills the whole world. Amen? Okay. That's that. I think I did it. Did I do well? Okay. All right. Now I need to pray one more time. Jesus, thank you for your word. Speak to us and change us on the inside. Go deep in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today's Pentecost, and Pentecost was, in the Old Covenant, a great day of thanksgiving. As the ancient church of Israel also, they, they were not only thankful for the Lord himself, but for the first fruits of the wheat harvest, it was an incredible day of remembering uh, the law of God that was given on Mount Sinai. How many of you remember uh, what happened on the top of Mount Sinai? Does anybody have an idea? Anybody remember? Let me say it another way. What descended upon the top of Mount Sinai? Anybody remember? Sorry, I have an in-ear on this one. And so I'm functioning at 50%. Scream it. The glory cloud came, right? And that cloud was shrouded in great darkness, the Bible says, and filled with fiery light. And from the midst of that cloud, the voice of the Lord came, which is incredible. Imagine watching that take place as the children of Israel, watching heaven literally come to the earth. And some of the ancient Hebrew scholars would actually say it that way, that, that the Lord himself, that heaven's environment and atmosphere 
touched Sinai and the two became one. Isn't that amazing? It shows so much. It shows the heart of God to come be with his people. It shows the desire for, uh, in God's heart to invite his friends into the cloud, which is what I talked about last Sunday night, which, by the way, if you haven't been on a Sunday night, you're missing out. They have been absolutely sacred. You need to get there tonight. Bring your family and just get into the presence of the Lord. So here we see the Lord's desire to come down. Say that, to come down. I'd like to begin with a question this morning. Why would God come down? What, what is in the heart of God that would cause him to come down? Love, you got it. In Exodus 25, now why don't we turn there? You don't mind reading your Bible in church, right? Okay. In Exodus 25, verse 1, the Scripture says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Offerings are not man's idea, by the way. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And that should happen in every service. We should willingly give to the Lord. Amen? And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, by the way, if you're taking notes, that speaks of Jesus, our God, the divine one. Silver, that speaks of Jesus, the Redeemer, the one who comes to save. Bronze, that speaks of the Lord Jesus who took and became our sin. Blue, that speaks of the Lord Jesus who is the revelation of God who has come from the heavens. Purple, that speaks of the Lord Jesus who is our King. Say amen. I'm getting stirred up a little bit with each one. Scarlet thread, Jesus, the one who bleeds as our Savior. Fine linen, the sinless one. Goat's hair, our sin substitute. Ram skins dyed red, the one who is our covering, our propitiation. Badger skins, this speaks of the suffering of Jesus. Badger skins are very difficult to look at, but they do an incredible job at what they are supposed to accomplish. They actually covered the top of the tabernacle tent with badger skins. It kept the rain and the elements out, but it was very ugly. To the world, Jesus is not worth coming to. He's considered boring. His followers are considered fanatics. And that's why the cross is an offense. Why would anyone want to follow a crucified man who's been skinned alive as a criminal who is hanging on a tree between two other criminals? What is it about this ugly one in their eyes that is worth following? But how many of you know he may have been ugly to the eye, to the fallen, but beautiful to those who love him? And how many of you know he does an amazing job at saving our soul? And acacia wood, this speaks of his incorruptibility. Acacia wood is an incorruptible wood. And of the cross, the crucified one. Oil for the light. He's the baptizer and the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen before I jump down there. Spices for the anointing oil. Spices speak of his character. Now think of this. You couldn't just pour oil on the high priest back then. You had to put spices in the oil. And you couldn't just dump oil. I'm sorry, you couldn't just dump spices because it would blow off. 
you needed the oil to contain and hold the spices so that it would be an irreversible fragrance on the high priest. Without the oil, you have no fragrance. You have no, I should say, without the oil, you have no ointment. And so the two become one here, oil and fragrance. It is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone who carries, offers, and smears us in the character of Jesus. And the spices all speak of a different aspect of Jesus. Throughout the scriptures, myrrh was brought to Jesus because he would die. What did they clothe him in or bathe him in after he died? One of those spices were myrrh and aloes. That's what the Bible says, right? What did the wise men come with? Myrrh. They were prophetically declaring, here's the Lamb of God. Calamus is a sweet-smelling fragrance or spice. That speaks of the sweetness of his presence and the sweetness of worship. Isn't he wonderful? Uh, frankincense, for instance, speaks of his priestly ministry. Am I going too fast? We need, we need to teach the Bible again. Oh, sorry, I'll slow down. We need to teach the Bible again. If this is overload, it's just because you haven't been hearing the word. This is it's just the Bible. We need to stop preaching messages on how to make people's dreams come true and talk about Jesus. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, the more I look, I'm like, we've raised up worshipers who are pop stars and pastors who are life coaches. And the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Numbers are increasing, campuses are expanding, but the nation's going to hell. It doesn't work. Sorry, I had an earache this morning. And I'm just over it all. It doesn't work. It does not work. It's been proven to not work. We, we bumped into a test in 2020 and 2021. In many cases, not in all, we failed miserably as a church. It showed us who we really are, which is that we all need help. We need Jesus again. We need Jesus again. My God, we need Jesus again. Church needs to stop filling arenas to go watch people who, who, who say they're worship leaders, but they're not even singing about Jesus. It all just needs to stop. And you need to change the dial and be a powerful man and woman of God. And you determine what you listen to. And you determine what you get to read. And Come on, let's go. Let's get into Jesus here. This thing is... No, I felt the presence of God. No, you didn't feel the presence of God because you left the same. One time, can I vent? Okay. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, uh, we, we literally have a generation at this point that on a mass scale has not corporately run into the cloud and wouldn't have any idea of what he's like in there. But we're filled with initiative, talking about all we're going to accomplish. Doesn't work like that. Unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. One time I was preaching at a well-known church, and I was just up there on the platform, and I asked for the keyboardist. A well-known worship leader refused to even get on the platform and help me because they said, oh, we don't know what to do up there when he's up there. That was so telling to me. I thought, what do you mean you don't know what to do? This is what you do, right? You minister to the Lord. You should know his movement, his heart, what he wants in the moment. That's what a worship leader does. That's what true Levites do. They're with him all the time. What do you mean you don't know? What, if you don't know that, what do you know how to do? If the presence freaks us out, there is a place in the presence where it should freak us out, but if we don't know what he's like in the presence, that just reveals a lot. Amen? Amen. That was your spanking. Now you'll be healed with some nice organic ointment. Are you ready? <laughs> it wasn't your spanking. You're an amazing church. But I have to hit at these things occasionally. 
because they're demons and principalities and they just need a nice slapping. Sweet incense, verse 7, onyx stones. This is so powerful. It speaks of the covenant of God and his character and who he is. The ephod is <clears throat> set in the breastplate. In other words, God carries the stones who also represented the tribes of Israel. God carried them on his heart. Each tribe also represented a different character of the Lord, a different characteristic, I should say. Amazing. Imagine you serve a high priest today. The Hebrew says he still ministers in the heavenly tabernacle who wears you on his heart. That should have made you much more excited. So the high priest back then would carry these stones on his chest that's true priestly ministry, true Christian leadership, is to carry the people on your heart when you minister to the Lord. Amen? Verse 8, and this is what I want to get to. And let them make me, listen carefully, a sanctuary. That I may dwell among them. Let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. That's why God comes down. Close your eyes for a moment. Say, Jesus wants to live with me. Keep your eyes closed. Say, Jesus wants to live on me. Say, Jesus lives in me. To every believer, the Holy Spirit lives within them. Everyone, every believer who has come to the Lord Jesus, repented of their sin, turned to him in faith, put all their trust in him and him alone, in his death, burial, and resurrection, whether they're Baptist or so Pentecostal, the Pentecostals won't even claim them, the Holy Spirit lives in us all. It is really theologically incorrect to ask someone who you don't think speaks in tongues if they have the Holy Spirit. You're welcome. <laughs> Everyone who doesn't speak in tongues goes, thank you. I love this church. My Lord. Okay. You cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit inside of you. John the Beloved wrote that it is the Holy Spirit who bears witness that we are children of God. An old preacher, he's probably not old anymore because he's in heaven, so I would assume he's young. But he told me once, he said, don't settle for the tongue when you can have the whole shoe. His assembly's a God preacher who actually became a real friend and in some ways a pastoral influence in Catherine Kuhlman's life. His name was Ralph Wilkerson. He became a dear friend of mine. He pastored a great church during the Jesus Movement, Charismatic Renewal, called Melody Land. And when I lived in California, even after that, I spent so much time with him this was funny. One time, David Papavisi and I, you guys all know Dave? He'll, he'll be back uh, hopefully soon. But he, he uh, Dave and I went to see him, and he was telling us these stories about Catherine. And Catherine asked him if, if he would allow his wife, whose, whose name is Aileen, not Eileen, Aileen, to fly and go play organ for Catherine in one of her healing services in Pittsburgh. And Pastor Ralph was hard of hearing. This was so funny. So when I sit with men like that, you know, I don't just kick my feet up and say, hey, Ralphie, how are you? You know, it's like, hey, Pastor Ralph, you know, I don't even talk unless he asks me to. And um, he looks me in the eye and he goes, <laughs> and Dave had never met him. 
And he looks at me, he goes, I sense the anointing on you. And I said, oh, that's, that's encouraging. That's good. He said, I'm hard of hearing. Come open my ears. And we were drinking tea. And I'm like, now? Literally, we're drinking tea, had a little parakeet in a cage, the whole thing. Remember his house, babe? And uh, it just wasn't like the moment. And then he goes, come on, come to your job. He goes, Catherine needed atmosphere and worship and all that. He goes, Benny likes worship too. He goes, you don't need that. Come on, you're the next generation. Open these ears. And I go, uh, uh, he goes, and then I hesitated. He goes, stick your finger in my ear and open it. He was like 80. And I didn't know him. So I was like, in your ear? In the ear? Just stretch my hand? We do that one? So he looked at Dave. He goes, you too. And Dave's like, Dave looked at me real quick. <laughs> uh, so we got up and uh, I stood behind him because I didn't want him staring at me the whole time. So I got behind him. He was facing that way. And we went for it. They didn't open. But... Those were great times, and he taught me so much about the Holy Spirit. It, I was told that he would walk down um, the aisle from the back door for the altar call. He'd just walk right down, and they would sing, there's something about that name, and the choir, and he would, he would help lead it. And then he'd just stand at the platform and say, who wants Jesus this morning? And hundreds would come. And one of the things Pastor Ralph taught me, and obviously my father-in-law taught me, and so many, was that it is the Holy Spirit who draws us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit. This is the most important thing he does. To so many of us who grew up in charismatic Pentecost, we limit him to a prayer language, which is a tragedy. And you know as well as I do, if you grew up in church, that many of the people who thought they were speaking in tongues were not. Come on. They weren't. Before I got filled with the Spirit, I think I've shared this with you before, ladies would say, just repeat after me. And something in my 12-year-old little heart that didn't know much of the Bible used to think thoughts like this. Certainly, the baptism of the Spirit has to be a little more glorious than copying after this lady. And does every prayer language have to include Shabbat? Is it such a uniform utterance? Because everyone's does. Or Rhonda? <laughs> or Shonda? Now, this might be in yours, and I'm not taking a knock at it. I'm just saying, could there be something more vast and beautiful that the Lord has for us? And I'm so glad I did not copy a prayer language and settle. I know I'm making people mad right now. Hopefully not here. But the, the great sign, according to Scripture, that somebody has been empowered by the Spirit is not their prayer language. The great sign is power to be a witness. The great sign is power. That's what Jesus said. And if Jesus said it, it's right. I said, if Jesus said it, it's right. If you're confused theologically, copy Jesus. Jesus. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You. This isn't to birth doubt in you or make light of what the Lord has given you. It's not that. I'm really messing with you a little bit with a plan in mind to get you to not settle. To get you to not settle. I'm so glad I didn't settle. 
I tell our students, I'm so glad I didn't choose Crisco and got the real oil by his mercy. And being a witness is much more vast than witnessing. Witnessing is part of that. But being a witness means to exude him, to drip him, to breathe him. It means he's in the shadow when you walk by. There's something beautiful that takes place when the Holy Spirit becomes friends with someone. Because all of us, anybody in their right mind who is, is loving the Lord, loves his presence. We all do. I mean, of course he comes in certain ways. I've, I've had this happen two or three times in my life where I felt like I would die. We've all had that, hopefully. If, if Maybe you haven't, but if you have, it's healthy. We need to understand the fear of the Lord. This is vital. But even in those moments, it's so difficult to explain, but it's still wonderful. Isn't it? Even the moments where you feel like if you're going to breathe the wrong way, you might die. Yet something deep within us is saying, and it makes no sense in our earthly mind, please don't let this end. Right? Yeah. So it's natural as a child of God to love the presence of your father because he's a good father. I said, he's a good father. And just like when a good father walks through the front door, his children run to him, it's natural to love his presence, and you should love his presence, which, by the way, is the actual him. You should love his presence more than you love anyone or anything. It is fully legal to be addicted to the presence of the Lord. Fully addicted. It is totally normal to want to sense his presence while you're driving. Just don't close your eyes. It's normal. It's not extreme. It's not fanaticism to crave the presence of the Spirit. It's not fanaticism once he gives you a drink to ask for three more. I said it's not fanaticism. It's the normal Christian life to drown in the river of God. Mm. That's normal. Can I keep going a little? It's normal to not want to listen to garbage when you can drink of him. That's all normal. It's the normal Christian life to have joy when people think you should not. It's just, that's what Christianity is. We're in but not of. That's what it means to be the head and not the tail. I don't know where we've gotten so screwed up in our theology that all of a sudden that became merely political. Missing out on the beauty of it. To be the head and not the tail means that we are led of the Lord, that at any moment we can drink, whether nuclear bombs are going off, two miles away, Jesus is king. Yes. That's the point. It's so we, we live, we live in another place, and that place is a person called the Holy Spirit. So Paul said it this way. He said, it is in him we live. It is in him we move. And it is in him that we have our being as he's addressing the pagans in Greece. Speaking about this person of the Holy Spirit who is so vast, he is omnipresent. David said it like this, whether I come up to the heavens or make my bed in hell, you are there. And so, to be baptized into the Holy Spirit, which is what Pentecost is all about. 
God coming down, you ready? To swallow us up. To swallow us up. I'll say it again until somebody gets excited. To swallow us up. To become our world. So John, well, let me read it to you. Go to John, the Gospel of John. John 1, 29. Oh, gosh, the Lord's about to slap you. I'm going to start handing out mouth guards at the front door in your little visitor bag. Helmets and mouth guards. John 1, 29. Can you all see me, media team? Can they see me? The next day, John saw Jesus, this is John the Baptist, coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The only way to behold him is if he's coming toward you. So if your vision is increasing of Jesus, that's only happening because he's saying yes to you. He's coming your way. Behold doesn't mean temporarily look upon. Behold means look and let that look turn into a stare and then never stop staring. Behold means to hold with your eyes. You lock in and then you hold that gaze for as long as possible. Jesus loves it when we look at him. I said Jesus loves it when we look at him. Behold the Lamb of God. Obviously John here is pointing the people's attention back to Abraham's declaration over Isaac that the Lord would provide a lamb. So now here John the Baptist is saying, here he is. It's taken generations and generations to get to this moment, but here's the one that Abraham prophesied. He's also touching on Isaiah's prophecy that it would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. I also want to point your attention to this. That John, obviously, because it's the scriptures and they're perfect, John introduces Jesus in the proper order. This is so important. He introduces him as Savior of the world. And because that introduction is proper, we should experience him in the same order, as Lamb of God first. Then, look, look down to your Bible. Verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Here John is saying he's God and man, all in one. He's before me, but he's man. I did not know him, but that, said, but that he should be revealed to Israel Therefore, I came baptizing with water. So he's saying all of my baptisms have led up to this moment. My baptismal ministry is unto the Lamb. What he's basically saying is, I am the best man of this wedding ceremony. This is what he meant when he told his disciples, he must increase and I must decrease. And in a Hebraic wedding, in a Hebrew wedding, um, and in, in, in our weddings today, the best man stands next to the groom, right? And who brings the bride in? 
the father. Would any father in his right mind give his bride away to an unworthy husband? No. Well, we do it all the time. That didn't happen in my house. And the people said, it has to be a worthy husband. Say a worthy husband. So the father walks his gift down the aisle and offers this gift to his bride arrayed in white, a people washed in the blood, and offers the bride to a worthy husband. And for that husband to be deemed a worthy husband, that husband had to, hopefully, in a healthy home, has to carry certain qualities. Like if you sleep in all day long and don't work, you would never marry my daughter. Right? If you don't love Jesus, you would never marry my daughter. Right? If you don't like golf, you would never, ever <laughs> marry my daughter. Okay? Oh, man. There's just so much more. So many other things that would cause me to say that. Well, anyways, let me keep going. You have a worthy husband, and the best man stands next to the groom. The moment the father introduces the bride to the worthy husband, the best man takes a step away, right, and joins the rest of his groomsmen. This is what John meant when he told his disciples, he must increase, I've done my job, the bridegroom of Israel is now walking through the Holy Land. He is now meeting the children of Israel. Listen, who left him and committed adultery against him? This is what Hosea says. This is what Jeremiah begs for, begs the bride, Israel, to come back to the Lord. But, but she chooses harlotry, Hosea says, by worshiping other gods. Did you know any time you offer your worship to another God, even though you continue to worship Jesus, any time you offer your worship to another God, it is harlotry in God's eyes. You might say, I don't worship other gods. Oh, money, money is. Status is. Man's opinion is. Worship is nothing more than the bowing down of the heart in recognition of something's might. And worth. So now the Lord comes to reconcile this harlot called Israel. What an amazing bridegroom who comes to buy her with his blood, even though she cheated on him for generations. This is our Jesus. So in that moment, John goes, okay, time for me to decrease. That was a difficult experience for John. We know that he even sent an envoy to Jesus asking if Jesus was the one to come. As human as John was, he was still chosen by the Lord. Now, verse 32. And John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So John compares, listen carefully, his baptism in many ways as a model of spirit baptism. And the reason I'm talking about this, as I said earlier, is I want you to understand that this is so much 
bigger than a specific gift. But this is a life-changing encounter where the whole atmosphere of your life shifts and you begin to live in a different place. This is how John compares it. He says, I baptize you of water, but there's one coming after me who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. So let's look at that for a second. John says, you see the way I do this? Come up here, Ryan, real quick. You didn't jump up there like Deanna. A little older. Are you older than him? Okay, well, I'm trying to help you. All right. So John says, John's standing in a river. Okay? And John's whole ministry is to point people to the land. The whole context is marital. The people didn't know that the Jordan had become their bridal bath, their wedding bath. This is the pattern of the scriptures. We see this happen with Esther. She has to bathe before she approaches the king. So John is standing in these waters of baptism. They are moving water. I mean, you know, the Holy Spirit is moving. He is the wind of heaven, as I said earlier, right? He is the river of God. He is a spring who gushes forth from our innermost being. You want to be in an environment where the river is moving. If the river's not moving, it is still. If it's still, it will become putrid. That's why the Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters. After many days, it will return to you. If those waters aren't moving, that bread's not coming back. So John's standing here, and he says, I baptize you, I baptize you, in water. And he would do that by plunging them into the river. Now, because they are in a natural body, they have to come up for air. Fair enough? Okay. You can go sit down. I just want him to get the visual. John is saying, the one who's coming after me is going to do the same thing to you, but not in a river of water. He's going to plunge you into a river who is a person and never let you come up for air. That water prepared you for this one who will baptize you in fire. In the Holy Spirit and fire. And fire is an end time experience. It is a cleansing experience. Remember what he said. His winnowing fan is in his hand. In other words, this last great great generation, I believe, we don't know for sure, but I think we all look at Bible prophecy and go, Jesus is coming. Who knows? But this could very well be the last generation. This could be the generation who watches Jesus pierce the sky. That generation is meant to wear fire. Because if she wears fire, the dross is removed. And she'll be found ready, listen, because she's been in a spiritual bath that has cleansed her and purified her of herself. Yes, of her past sin, but also of her current desire that causes her to resist the will of the bridegroom. So Jesus makes this statement to his disciples. We're going to stay on this for a couple of weeks. Jesus makes this statement. He says, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he is with us. And shall be in us. He said that to the disciples. He's with you. And he shall be in you. Why am I mentioning this? Because it goes back to what I said earlier. You cannot receive Jesus. Unless the Holy Spirit. Leads you to him. 
If I had to draw out a theology cartoon for children, I would draw a picture of a dove leading that little child to Christ crucified. And then once that little child comes to Christ crucified, this bleeding lamb, and sees the glory and beauty of the one who came to die and discovers that since he died, they willingly now die for him and with him. That dove that led the little child to Christ crucified now comes to live inside the little child. Is he still with the little child? Absolutely. But now he's also with and in. And he's in us, according to 1 John, listen carefully, he's in us, in every born-again believer. He lives in us, and that interior indwelling is so that no matter what we face, we can drink from a river. Turn to John 14, and then I'll pray. Are you enjoying this? Are you thankful for the Holy Spirit? John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. I can preach on that. By the way, the fruit of love is obedience. One of them. There are about four or five. Verse 16. And I will pray the Father. And he will give you another helper. That he may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit is with us forever. There is nothing to be afraid of. Not gas prices, not the economy, not this, not that, not politicians, nothing. There's nothing to be afraid of. The Holy Spirit is with us forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. We do such a disservice to people who don't know the Lord by saying, oh, yeah, yeah, no, God lives in you too. No, he does not. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can only dwell in a vessel that has been purchased and washed in the blood of Jesus. That is why before the priest would put oil on something, he first poured blood on it. Something must be cleansed with blood before it is filled with oil. The world cannot receive because it neither sees him. Have you ever bumped into this where you said to someone who didn't know the Lord, that was God? And they go, that wasn't God. That was you. You're like, I'm not that good. That was the Lord. You, you might say, that was the Lord. They say, that's not the Lord. That's a, just a coincidence. What, what's going on there? They can't see his work because they cannot receive him, nor knows him. They don't know his presence. They don't know his character. They don't know his touch, but his church should. We should. We should know him. But you know him. Now, Jesus, who is he speaking to here? Say the disciples. Why would he say that to them? But you know him? Had they been indwelt by the Spirit yet? Say no. No, he had not died and been raised yet. They were not born again. So here's my question. How did they know him? How could the disciples, who were not redeemed, unregenerate at the time, they were not born again, how was it that they knew the Holy Spirit? Because he was on, in, and all around Jesus. So for them to stay in contact with the Holy Spirit, they had to stay very close to Jesus. Amen? 
for he dwells with you. He was with them because Jesus was with them. Remember what John said? I saw the one whom he came upon. Listen, this is the, this is, this is the kicker. And remained. This is so important. Listen. This is saying, this Jesus is different than Isaiah. I feel the Lord now. He is different than Jeremiah. He's different than Moses. He's different than Samson who can sin and then be used of God. He's different than Saul who's anointed. He's different than, as I said, different than David who can be used of God and then slip up and then used of God again. John isn't saying this one whom I saw is used of him or frequently empowered. He's saying the, the, the line of demarcation the one, this distinction upon this one is that the Holy Spirit came upon him, listen, and stayed. He stayed. Now listen, it's that remaining that is proof that he's the only one qualified to baptize you into the one that he is clothed with 24-7. It's that remaining peace. Now, now listen, why would the Spirit remain? Listen carefully. Because of Jesus' perfection? Absolutely. Because of his deity? Absolutely. Did, G did Jesus trust the Holy Spirit? Say, yeah, he did, because he was led of the Spirit. He followed him everywhere. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. He be, he, that's why one of the reasons we call him the type and pattern, the pattern son, I should say. If Jesus followed the Spirit, we should. But there's something else. Yes, Jesus trusted the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit trusted Jesus. The Holy Spirit trusted Jesus. Do you remember when Noah let the bird out the first time from the ark? Why did the bird return? Because it found no place to rest. Then the bird returns with what? An olive branch. And then rests. This was a prophetic declaration that the only one who was found worthy to rest and remain upon was the Lord Jesus, the Ark of the Covenant himself. The true Noah's Ark who shields us from the waters of judgment. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Listen carefully. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Help me there, Joel. John 16, 5. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow fills your heart. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go back to my father, basically, and You've become so dependent on me, basically, you don't, you don't know how to live without me right here like this in the flesh. And sorrow fills your heart. And nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. 
And when he has come, he'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Oh, I love verse 13. However, in other words, he could not tell the disciples then in the flesh what he can tell those who receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Are you hearing that? He will take the deep treasures that belong to the Lord Jesus, the inheritance of the Lord Jesus, the deep wisdom within the Godhead, and share it with us. I just read to you, he will tell us of things to come. Do you realize we have an assurance? We have a connection with Almighty God that the world does not have. When the world is fearful, what's next, what's next? The Holy Spirit knows and wants to tell us. Most of it's right here in the scriptures. But regarding your future, where you should live, where you should go, who you should marry. Will I ever get married? Am I too old to get married? What am I called to? The Holy Spirit knows. I'm not against counseling, and clearly I'm not against pastoring. <laughs> but I have a question. Have you asked the Holy Spirit? Have you given him enough time to talk to you? Have you given him enough time to actually speak to you? He speaks on his timeline and on his terms. Would you just close your eyes for a moment? The Christian life is a life of a true relationship. Listen, listen, listen to me. Don't look anywhere else. Don't just close your eyes and look. Listen, 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 listen right now. The Christian life is a life of true relationship with the Lord. I'm not sure we even realize. Don't, whatever you do, don't be looking around, don't move around. It's a very holy time. I'm not sure we realize what we say or what we ask when we say, do you have a relationship with Jesus? The true Christian life is nothing less than a full-blown relationship. And in any relationship, listen, listen, people talk, they listen, requests are made. In this case, love is exchanged. The Christian life's not even meant to be boring, not in the least. Let the world see him as the one who wears badger skins. To us, he's the one who's glorious and colorful and beautiful and majestic. And the scripture says, according to Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would take what is his and share it with us. How real is Jesus to you? I'm, I'm speaking to you as somebody who loves you under the anointing this morning. How real is Jesus to you? Is it a true relationship? Imagine that when you come to the Lord Jesus, he takes, according to his word, all of our sin that on our best day 
is a filthy rag. He takes it all, and all of the stain, all of our past, listen carefully to me, there's nobody in here who doesn't have a past. No one, no one. Unless it's been washed in the blood. He takes all of our past, everything, everything we're ashamed of, the stuff we didn't know we did, because he holds us accountable for that as well, according to the scripture. The Bible says, in sin hath my mother conceived me. Jesus takes all of that, and it was placed upon him, and all of that stuff that broke the heart of God, was nailed to the cross. And since our blood could not wash it away, he offered his blood that was perfect. And that blood washes every stain away. At that point, we are blood washed and blood bought. He purchases us and washes us. Then, the scripture teaches, our bodies, because remember, blood first, then oil, our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then God makes our lives his home, our actual bodies. And he comes to live deep within our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I want to speak directly to some of you here who have never known the love of God. You've, not, you're not, you've never experienced the love of God. I remember that old Kim Walker song she used to talk about, if you've ever experienced the love of God. You know, you know, you know. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 5, that it is the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Given. If you've never known the love of a real father this morning, you've never known the love of family, I'm here to tell you there's a love so great it will greatly eclipse every other love you ever longed for. Then the Holy Spirit takes up residence deep within us. And wherever we go, we are never alone again. That's why the veil tore in two when Jesus died. It was to say two things. Now you can come into the Holy of Holies. But it also said... The glory of God is leaving this building to come and now live in a people. That is the Christian life. That is the Christian experience to have our sins washed away, to be justified, to stand before God in His righteousness, and then to be filled with the glorious presence of the Lord. For those of you who feel lonely in this room, you don't ever need to feel lonely again. Never again. And I feel that many of you, many of you here, you've wondered where God has gone. He's not gone anywhere. It's just you've looked away. And one look became 10, and 10 became 100, and then it became a lifestyle of looking away. Don't you miss him? And if you do miss him this morning, it's only because he misses you. Would you all stand, please? With every head bowed and eye closed, you say, Michael, this is what I want. I want this more than anything, what you're talking about. I want you to come down. Just come right down. For the first time or the 30th time, you come right down this morning. Come learn what it is to fellowship with the Lord, to live a true Christian life, to truly see 
the Holy Spirit fill you. Give the Lord praise. And surely live a life in the Spirit of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Yeah, there's no shame. There's no shame. You just come. This is what a relationship with the Lord is. Thank you, Father. If you brought somebody to church this morning, maybe they're a little nervous right now. They're supposed to be. This is supposed to be costly. It just is. But I don't want you to be so nervous that you're afraid to look them in the eye right now and say, do you need to get down there? Do it now. Do it now. Maybe you're sitting next to someone. You know their life. Yeah, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing... This world is so shallow, so incapable of satisfying the soul. They're still coming. Thank you, Lord. I give you all the praise. I give you, come on, church. Thank you. I give you all the praise. This world is so incapable of satisfying your heart. Do you know why we struggle with sin, the stuff you can't stop doing? You're just looking for false satisfaction. That's all. You're choosing things that can't satisfy. Come, yeah, come. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give you all the glory. All the glory. So wonderful. So wonderful. Children, if you can hear my voice this morning, I don't think there are many kids in the room today. But if you can hear me and understand me, and you want Jesus, I want you to tell your mom and dad right now, or whoever brought you. You say, Mom and Dad, I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. the work of the Holy Spirit. Team, would you come out? I want every single person with a hand on their shoulder. Every one of them. So as many of us that are needed, we should have enough on these front rows. Joe, come out. Come on out. Isn't the Lord wonderful? Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Now I'm going to begin praying. And by the way, by the way, you will never be free from sin by merely attempting to resist it. The more you fight it, the more gasoline you throw on it. Attention is fuel in the spiritual life. So what's the answer? The answer is to come to Jesus, give him your affection, and then begin learning to live in the Spirit. And the Bible says if you live in the Spirit, Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's what you need, church. It's what we all need. So I'm going to begin praying. And as I pray, as I pray, if you feel in your heart, I need to, I need to get down there. All I would say is recklessly obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. I want all of us to pray this out loud. Can we do that? Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you because you invited me. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Lord, my soul needs rest. My sins are many. Forgive me. I have sinned against you. Cleanse my soul. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for bleeding and dying when I should have bled and died. Today I repent. I turn from my own will and the ways of this world and I turn directly to you, Lord Jesus. You own my life. I willingly give it to you. Receive me as I receive you. You died, you were buried, and raised again. 
And today, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. One day, you will come back again. Find me ready. I'll say that again. Find me ready. One more time. Find me ready. In Jesus' name, you are the Son of God. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise. Now listen, listen. The Bible says, on that day we celebrate today. Aren't you glad he did not leave us as orphans? He said, I'll come to you. The context was the Spirit. I just read it to you. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come. He's coming again in the clouds. But how many of you are grateful that the cloud came as well? On that day, they were all praying in one accord. I want to read this to you. Oh, I feel the power of God coming on. I'm going to read this to those who've, overcome, who've come forward and those of you in your seats. And as I read it, I want you to believe God. And you don't have to work for this. In fact, you would just get in the way. Don't you dare work for it. Only oh, Jesus already worked for it. I just want you to receive. Just lift your hands to heaven. And as I start reading this, I believe, I believe this, that the fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. All you have to do is receive as a child now. On the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we are in one accord this morning and all of our hearts say, we say with our mouths, we want you, Holy Spirit. Oh, we want you, Holy Spirit. We are not ashamed of you. We're not ashamed of what you do and how you do it. We don't need to figure you out. We only know that without you, we die. And we willingly admit our weakness. But you make the weak strong. Come, Holy Spirit. Jesus, stretch forth your hand. You taught us to ask the Father. You said, how much more would your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? All you have to do right now is ask. Say, say Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Come on, just say it in your own way. Don't repeat it the way I am. Just, just say it in your own way. Say it in your own way. Many of these people coming forward are being touched by the Holy Spirit deeply. Fill them in Jesus' name. Fill them. 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 Fill everyone in this room from front to back. Oh, church, just, just lift your hands. Look toward heaven. Be filled, be filled, be filled, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let all sorrow be replaced by joy. Let all hopelessness be replaced with the hope of the nations. Let everybody who's dry be dripping with oil. Let the dormant burn in Jesus' name. Let the holy fire of God fall upon those who've lost first love. In the mighty name of Jesus, receive, receive, receive. The one, the one who comes to make Jesus real the Holy Spirit. Receive now. Those of you watching in your homes, may your homes be filled and charged with the reality of the person of the Spirit who makes Jesus real. Oh, Jesus, I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you all the 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 praise. May you leave with the life of God in you, the joy, joy unspeakable, and full of glory. Full of glory. Oh, Jesus, we love you. Uh, 
praise you, Lord. Sarah, come here. Would you quick just come up here? I want Sarah to sing this over you guys, and then you can, you're free to leave, but the Holy Spirit is just moving. He's just moving. Close your eyes right now and just begin to gaze upon him. Just begin to gaze upon him. You'll feel his presence. And when you do, when you feel his presence, this is what you do. This is how you get more. You just begin to worship. That's what Jesus said. He said, when you drink, that, that, that spring in you will begin to flow. Oh, how I love Jesus. Where are you, Sarah? Where is she? Oh, she's grabbing a mic. Oh, how I love Jesus. Sing that, church. comes to do to set us on fire for Jesus Start singing this, I'm telling you. The Lord will continue to fill you. Lift your voices a little, I'm telling you. The Lord will respond. Sing it again. to Jesus every second of every day. Be blessed in Jesus' name. I declare a blessing over you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? For those of you, those of you who came forward, we would love to connect with you. There's a table out front. Is that right, David? We have one out front. Please stop by that table. Do we have any of those brochures? They have them? Did they get them? Let's give those. We want you to get one of these brochures. We really want to connect with you and help you follow Jesus. It would be a great honor to do that. See you tonight. We do not receive communion this morning. Forgive me. Tonight we will receive communion together, and the Lord will work great miracles. I know it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you tonight. Michael and Jess here. We are standing on the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. Local church, Jesus School, uh, House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, 
and the prayer house. And so listen, we just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that, we believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we wanna invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is gonna do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus' image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, 
and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.